Hey guys, good morning. I'm Pastor Timmy Riggs, and I hope you're doing well. And if you're in the room with us, then welcome. And if you're watching online, we love uh, that you're there with us as well, and we love to connect with you. So why don't you just in the chat real quick, say where you're watching from, because we just think that's really cool. I am here on the road today in Two Lakes, where we are at our pantry and at our clinic that is our part of our Two Lakes Community Church, and I'm with Pastor Thaddeus, who is just amazing. And um, I just want to ask him real quick a quick question about what God is doing through Two Lakes, through the church, through the pantry, all that, and I uh, would love for you to kind of answer that question real quick. Well, praise the Lord, Tim. Uh, thank you. Uh, and so, hey, I would say, you know, uh, this pantry couldn't be operated until uh, we would say individuals who have says yes to God. Mm. And so in that, let me just kind of give you just a, a quick uh, a view of this here. So needing a pantry manager, we had one to say yes, which was Sam. Then we had another one say yes, which is Kim. And I'm thinking like, praise the Lord. We building bridges, you know, we're, we're getting off into the community. We're coming in people's lives in a holistic way with food and with health. And so, man, I mean, the, even the church right now, is, even through this pandemic has been getting involved, hands and feet in this community. Uh, they're being here, they're serving. And so, man, uh, it's all operating all together. Yeah, yeah that's God so is, good. Yeah. That is, Pastor Rick helped us. Pastor Thaddeus yeah. was reading or preaching as well that yeah. Say Yes series yeah, we did a while correct. back. That and that's where we still are. We're yeah. constantly people who are saying yes to what God's calling us to. And we see big things happen. Yeah. We see needs yeah. being met, yeah. relationships being formed. Yeah. And so that's what's happening here. And it's so awesome. We love you, man. Hey, man. We're so it's thankful a, for you. It's a, it's a blessing. Uh, and if I say one more thing, I think I really love the pantry outreach mm. that when BFC is coming over, what, what a bridge that's coming over yeah. and, and coming Coming into the community that's, that's, that's helping. So it's, man, God is good. That's so good. So while we're here, let's do some behind the scenes tour. All right. So right now we're going to step into the pantry, let you see behind it a little bit. And we're going to meet Pastor Sam. And uh, he is right behind this door, I think. Maybe I'll open it. There he is. <laughs> anyway, hey, let's step in here, Sam. And um, I just want to ask you a quick question. First of all, this is space that maybe a lot of people haven't seen. Now, we have a lot of volunteers, and you might speak into that in a second. But uh, we have been connecting with so many people through the pantry. So real quick, can you tell us what God has been doing through the pantry? Man, absolutely. So our pantry, I mean, the best way to describe it is what Two Lakes Mission is, which is open arms. Um, truly, I mean, we had a lady, a quick story of a lady who came in and uh, she said she sometimes doesn't even come in to receive food. She just comes in to just hear conversation and to just be in the space while people are talking because it's positive. Um, it's a place where people, you know, feel like they belong, uh, a place where people feel seen, like it's not awkward um, and they're loved for just who they are. Um, and so kind of seeing people come as they are um, and be treated as, you know, a neighbor literally yeah. in this community. That's so good. So what are you hoping for? For and believing for God to do through the pantry in the upcoming months? Man, we're just hoping to grow. Truly, we're hoping to grow. Um, cool thing that's going on, we had our former liquor store five months ago was holding liquor bottles. Today, it's holding food. Um, and so, you know, we're dreaming with Pastor uh, Thaddeus and Kim Bryan about how that could be the pantry in the future to open up space, to grow, to reach more out into our neighborhood because um, they're our focus. They're our family and our neighbors. Yeah. So when I was have been here before, when, when you're packing food and, and delivering it out, it's so exciting. So many of your leaders are just, they just step up and they run it like a great machine in here. Uh, what are ways that people can get involved and be be like man i see it now i want to be over there when it's time to work so how can people step into that man come join us truly i mean the best um and the most important and effective thing that you could do is just come be a part of this mission um truly just black and white it's coming and being a part um, of what we're doing come serving with us hand in hand um, we don't bite here we're a family here and we want you to come as a family um, and serve with us at our pantry so you can sign up through our social media through the bfc website um, on how to volunteer here at the pantry yeah and in the app there's so many ways to get involved thank you sam appreciate yeah. it. And uh, with that, he noted Kim Bryan. And she is someone who's a huge part of what's happening here at the pantry, but at the clinic as well. And uh, she has been leading us just constantly saying, hey, God, open up doors, let the clinic be something that we can be a part of, making sure that people are getting the right health care that they need, getting uh, some medicine that they didn't always get before. And so today I'm here with Kim. Good to see you, Kim. Thank you. Yeah. Good to be here. Uh, so quick question, kind of the same question is w what have you seen God been doing the last few months or ever since we opened up the clinic? Oh, it is. Um, it's amazing. 
Every week we are seeing more and more patients. Uh, you know, we had to close for a few weeks because of COVID, but we've reopened about six weeks now. Every week we're seeing more and more. And I'm telling you, needs are being met. Um, you know, we're able to offer medications that some have not been able to get for weeks or months because maybe they've lost their job, they've lost their insurance, or they have, you know, chronic diseases that have not been able to uh, be treated for months. And so uh, it's, it's amazing. But I'll tell you, even more than that is um, how the hearts are really just really changing, um, not only the patients, but the volunteers, you know, wow. yeah. I had one volunteer last week that said, oh, my word, I had no idea. I was not ready for this emotional connection that was going to take place with yeah. these patients. And, you know, trust is being built and relationships are being built. And, um, you know, you can you can see it on their faces when they come in. You know, that was um, it's just but it's, you know, in all honesty, it's nothing that we're doing. It is the love of Christ that is literally saturating this place. Yeah. And it's just obvious. It's yeah. so obvious. And it's a, it's a pretty cool thing. Well, and, and it's you being willing to let God use you. And so that's pretty awesome, too. And with that, you know, becoming more like Jesus, one of the best ways is by serving, right? So we're here. I want to give you a sneak peek of what the clinic looks like, too, because I think it will blow your mind. So let's move back to see some of these patients' rooms. It's incredible. This is the waiting room right here. Yep. Your kids can play all types of stuff, right? Yeah. So, and we'll keep moving through. We got some offices on the left. A couple of triage areas triaged and we have a couple of patient rooms and this i mean the patient rooms i mean will just blow your mind so kim as we're kind of looking at these rooms what are some things that you're hoping for in the next upcoming months that you're believing that god is going to continue to move oh man i would really uh my heart's desire is for us to be able to open more than just saturday mm. to be able to open more days a week yeah. uh that would be amazing yeah well that's awesome so i'll show you these last couple rooms and um we want to give some people some opportunities to actually answer that call in your prayer so what are some ways that people can get involved how, how do they sign up how do they get connected those types of things so they can uh, get connected through social media, of course, and then also through the BFC website. Mm -hmm. There is a Sign Up Genius link that they can go and sign up for shifts. Okay, yeah. awesome. Yeah, and if you have any questions, we have so many different ways for you get to get connected with us. You can use the Connect form. You can go to the app. You can go to the website. You can call the church. Don't let not knowing how to get connected keep you from getting connected. So um, reach out to us. Anyway, uh, so thankful for you guys. And one one last announcement. We are really excited for the uh, prayer walk that we're going to have on June 19th from 4.30 to 7 p.m. right here in Two Lakes on Lyrewood. And uh, the address is 7525 Night Lake Drive. So don't miss it. It's going to be a great opportunity for you to get connected, build some relationships. We believe God is doing amazing things through Pastor Thaddeus, through Sam, through Kim, and all the volunteers at our Two Lakes uh, pantries and clinic. And so we want you to be a part of that. But today, hey, let's continue to worship. And uh, I love you guys. I hope you're doing well. We'll talk to you later. BFC. It's good to have everyone here, either present in this room or online. We greet you in the name of the Lord. If you'd like to stand, let's worship together. Come thou fount, come thou king. Let's sing it together. Come. 
today. God has blessed us so we can praise him. Is that right? We want to worship together. Well, put your hands together. Let's just celebrate the Lord together. Here we go. You have called us. You have called us out of darkest night into your glorious light. Praise 
In these weeks and months that we've been apart, and some still are away, we understand, that's why. It, it, it feels a little bit like exile to me. It's like being taken away from home, being put in a foreign land. And the Jewish nation understood that. They knew what exile was. They knew what it was to be pulled away from the place that they loved, the place that they loved dearly, Jerusalem, their place of worship. And in Psalm 137, these words express that. It says, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept. When we remembered Zion, there on the poplars we hung our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? If I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not consider Jerusalem my place of worship, my place to be with the Lord, my highest joy. So in this season, let's ask God for that joy, that gladness to fill our hearts again. In the 
these days of confused situations and in these nights of a restless remorse when the heart and the soul of a nation lays wounded and cold as a corpse from the grave of the innocent Adam comes a song bringing joy to the sad oh your cry has been heard and the ransom has been paid up in full oh be ye glad oh be ye glad oh be ye glad every death that you ever had has been paid again and again ah but this time the cell keys they're turning and outside there are faces of friends and though your body lays weary from wasting and your eyes show the sorrow they've had oh the love your heart is now tasting has opened the gate be ye glad oh be ye glad oh be ye glad every death that you ever had has been paid up in full by the grace of the Lord be ye glad glad these days seem anything but normal to us. But in the midst of days like these, we celebrate, we rejoice, we are still people of joy. I don't know, I came to church this morning feeling a lot of what Harlan has been sharing with us and my heart has been moved in these last few moments as he read the scripture about missing our place of worship. And I think I just want to say to those of you who are listening online this morning, you say, is it, is it good to be back? And is it, does it seem normal? No, it doesn't seem normal because you're not here. It won't seem normal until you get here and you are able to be here and worship with us. But it is good to worship all together, both presently and people online 
And I think our testimony and our story has been consistent, and that is that God has walked with us and continues to walk with us along this journey that we're on. I want to pray for you, okay? Lord, thank you so much. Thank you so much for letting us worship as a community of believers. Thank you, Lord, for meeting us when we come together. Thank you, Lord, for moments of like these when we are reminded of truth. My, in these last few minutes, my heart has just been touched. I felt your presence in such a powerful way. I know that I know that I know that you are with us. And I know that you hear us pray. And Father, I, I lift to you. I lift to you people who are feeling lonely today. People who are not able to see many people right now and just are dealing with loneliness. People who are desiring to come to the house of the Lord and worship and not yet able to do that. I pray for my friends Paul and Dana McGrady who are ministering to our Native American brothers and sisters today. I pray for our brothers and sisters in Swaziland. And I pray for our Native brothers and sisters who are struggling so bad under this virus. I pray for our nation today. Lord, you know that we've been praying throughout this week. We know nothing to do some days but to call on you. We ask you to speak to our own hearts, Lord. We pray for brothers and sisters who are suffering, who are hurting. Who among us would not be concerned about someone who is hurting. We pray, Lord, for justice. We pray for equality. All of us are created in your image. And we pray that you unite us. Lord, we come here to open our hearts to you also, as well as to give you praise. And as our hearts are open, we pray, Lord, that you speak to us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow. Good to see you. Good morning. Uh, I don't know about you, but I absolutely love summertime. Who loves summer? Who loves going out and immediately starting to sweat? Right here. Uh, Pastor Jake Garrett and I were hanging out yesterday, and we were just talking about our shared love for summer. It's not true. He hates it. He loves winter, but I love summer. Anyway, hey, I'm Pastor Timmy Riggs, and uh, thanks for being in here. And if you're online, welcome. We love you. Um, I have a couple things to tell you, and one of them is that we always want to make sure we're getting connected with you. So if this is your first time being here in the room or being online with us, we want to get connected because we believe we become best like Jesus together, okay? So what you can do, we started a new way to keep from us having to touch things. Uh, you can text in, all right? So if this is your first time, you can text welcome to the number, I think it's 369-7920. Did I get it? Yeah, all right. Uh, anyway, you can text welcome to that number and you will get some information on what to do there. Or if you have other questions, this isn't your first time, this is your home church, you've always been watching online, then you can text that same number and just text connect and you'll get some instructions there. If you have a prayer request, a question, feedback, anything like that, go ahead and do that as well. We, uh, we believe that there are always times for us to become more like Jesus. And so one of those ways that we can do that is through our Summer Grow Series classes that we're starting this week. Okay, so there's a few different classes. One of them is going to be a book study, and it's called Soul Keeping. Okay, so you can go. It's actually going to have an online session and an in-person session, of course, social distancing, all that. But uh, So that'll have two sessions, and you can get involved there, and you'll be reading through the book. 
There will also be a marital class. And so this is for anyone who wants to strengthen their marriage. This one will be completely online. And then there will also be an online class. If you're going through the grief of losing a loved one, a class of walking through how God wants to be near and dear to your heart. And all those things you can hear more about and sign up for at uh, the, the app or bethanynaz.org slash grow. And you can sign up, get more information, all that good stuff. So don't miss that. Also, hey, we just want to say thank you uh, for your, your generosity all the time. Before anything, before the COVID hit, uh, we were all, always been a church that just gives radically, and um, you guys continued to do that. We saw so many needs rise up, and you just continue to give, so we thank you for that. Right now, there are four ways to give. Again, ways to do it without having to touch much, okay? So you can go online, you can give at the app, you can drop it off in the mailbox, or there are boxes in the back that you can give that way as well. All right, well, hey, we're excited to hear from Pastor Rick this morning, and so we love you, I'm glad to see you. I hope you're doing well wherever you're at. All right, Pastor Rick. All right, we're starting a new series and study today in the book of 1 Peter, and I'm excited to share it with you. So I'm going to give you a word, and I'm going to give you the definition of the word as well. It's a word that you're pretty familiar with because of what's happened the last three months, but it's what we're calling the series essential. Let me, let me give you the definition, okay? When we talk about essential, we're talking about something of the utmost importance, something that is absolutely necessary, Something that is indispensable. We cannot do without this. And so over these last three months, we've heard a lot about essential businesses and essential workers and essential services. My daughter called me about three weeks into the shutdown and said, I never realized how much I love to shop at non-essential businesses until now. <laughs> it, it's kind of been in contrast with things that were non-essential non-essential businesses, workers, or services. And you may learn that you're a non-essential worker. However, when you think about the word non-essential versus essential, I think it gives us a good footing to think from as we begin to work our way through this book of uh, 1 Peter. So 60 AD, some 2,000 years ago, a guy whose name is Simon Peter writes a letter he is a major leader in the church of Jesus Christ. He writes a letter to a group of mostly Gentile Christians. So these are not people with a Jewish background remembering themselves as the people of God. They're mostly Gentile converts to Christianity. And he writes them a letter, and they are in the midst of crisis in their life. They are undergoing severe persecution. If you remember your history really, really well, emperors like Nero, who comes into reign around the late 50s and through the early 60s is beginning to take the lives of people for following Jesus. So they are in a crisis, and some of you would say, I've never experienced a crisis like that in my entire life. I can't imagine what these people are going through, what it's like to know that my life is in danger because I'm a follower of Jesus. So what Simon Peter does as he writes to these believers is he only deals with essentials. We're in a place like this in your life, you're not just going to talk about flipping stuff, right? No, you're going to deal with the stuff that really matters, the stuff that's really important. So what, what is essential besides oils? <laughs> See what I did there? Dad joke. Pretty, pretty bad, wasn't it? And I don't even know anything about essential oils. I just thought it would be funny to say that, so I did. Could, 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 I, could I challenge you to just begin to think hard with me about your own life and what you consider essential? 
So I know food, water, shelter, belongingness, safety, security, understand hierarchy of human needs. Let's, let's move just beyond those to say, so, so what are the things that are essential in your life? Rick, these are the things that are indispensable. These are the things that are absolutely necessary. These are the things that I cannot do without. They are of utmost importance. So you probably have a list. Here at Bethany First Church, we talk about essentials in the language of values. We say time with God is essential. Our relationship with Him is above everything else. Time with one another. And how much more did we come to understand this during the shutdown? That relationships and time spent with each other is so valuable to us. We would say, that's essential. Time with people who do not know Jesus, that's essential because we have a mission. How else do we tell people about Jesus unless we spend time with them? And living generously is essential. Giving not only of our time, but also of our resources. Very important to us as followers of Jesus Christ. In these first nine verses that we're going to read today, Simon Peter does something very beautiful, and you are going to come to love it. He doesn't come out and say these words exactly, but here is what he says. Knowing who you are is of utmost importance. Understanding your own identity is essential. Knowing who you are is absolutely necessary. Coming to grips with your own identity is indispensable. That's something you can't live without. So why don't you open your Bible to 1 Peter? Would you do that? 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. And over these next several weeks, we'll just kind of work our way through 1 Peter. Let me talk to you about it for a minute. So what do we know about Simon Peter, the author of this book. We know that he was one of the first 12 disciples that Jesus had chosen. You remember the story. He was fishing on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus comes by one day, and what does Jesus say to him? And his brother Andrew, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And so that's what happened. Simon Peter and his brother Andrew, they follow Jesus, and Jesus makes them fishers of men. We also know that Simon Peter was the first one to actually articulate Jesus' identity. He was the first one to really say, Jesus, you are the Messiah. You are the Son of the living God. And Jesus says to Simon Peter on that day, you will no longer be Simon, but now your name in Aramaic will be Cephas, which translated into Greek is Petros, Peter, which means rock. And on this rock, I will build my church on this confession. We also know that Simon Peter was the one who denied knowing Jesus the night that Jesus was arrested. I, I, don't, I don't know this guy. I don't know who you're talking about. I, I've never met him, I promise. I don't know who he is. But we also know that Simon Peter was later restored. And he becomes a great leader in the church of Jesus Christ. And he writes in the year of AD 60 to these mostly Gentile Christians in an area called Asia Minor. Let me show you a map real quick, okay? So over here is the Mediterranean Sea, and, and so this is the coast down through here of Israel. This is what is known as Asia Minor, okay? And so he names specifically in his letter Bithynia, Pontus, Asia, Cappadocia, and, and this is what is today modern-day Turkey. And so he's not writing like some letters were written to like an individual congregation addressing their specific issues, needs, concerns, desires. No, what he's doing is he's writing a letter that will circulate to churches like Ephesus that you would be more familiar with. And all around all of these churches, most of them planted by Paul on missionary journeys. And he's writing a letter that will be kind of circulated among many of these churches. So this is not just a one body of believers. This is to many churches in a large area, what is today called Turkey, okay? And here we go. Let me take you to that scripture. Chapter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, 
to God's elect, meaning these are people who are recipients of God's grace. The word that you heard this morning already, exiles, scattered throughout the provinces, and he names them of Pontus, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. You hear the identity language? You've been chosen through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with His blood. So chosen through the foreknowledge of God, sanctified through the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with His blood. In other words, you have the full trinity in this conversation. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. When he moves to the body of the letter after the greeting, he says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us this new birth into this living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's how it has come to us from the dead. And into an inheritance, this new birth, this living hope we find in this inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. So in all of this, you greatly rejoice. We're, we're joyful people. The default setting for the Christian is joy, though even now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. That would be putting it mildly, the kind of suffering they're going through. These have actually come so that the, so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. It's this idea that when you go through difficult times, your faith is actually proven. Many of you in the room are going to say, I get it. I understand it. That's true. It was actually in some of the most difficult seasons of my life that I realized, yeah, my faith is solid because it was my faith that brought me through. It was my faith that carried me through. I've kept the faith. Though you have not seen him, he says, meaning Jesus, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible, glorious joy. Again, we're the people of joy, for you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Yeah, this is God's word for us, and we're going to dive into it this morning. You know, there's a, there's a young man who attends our church. His name is Serge Kratovich. Doesn't sound like an American name, does it? Serge was actually born in the country of Bosnia. My wife Annette and I got to go to dinner with he and his wife Emily just a few months ago, and I called him and said, Serge, are you comfortable with me sharing some of your story in church on Sunday? And he gave me absolute permission. They have two young children and They've been a part of our congregation now for just over a year, and they are bright lights among us. When we went to dinner with Serge and Emily, he shared with me that he was actually a refugee from Bosnia. He said, you know, when the war broke out there and it became so severe, I was a little boy. And by the time that I was 10 years old, we had to flee to save our lives. One of the countries receiving Bosnian refugees was Germany. So he said, for five years we lived in Germany. We lived among other refugees in these two major buildings. And then there was a deal made with the United States Government of America to receive Bosnian refugees, and we were brought to America when I was 15 years old. And so in a conversation with him, I said, so when you, when you leave your home, your land, your country, and you carry with you only a few suitcases. What's it like? That night at dinner to me, he said, it's, it's challenging. I, I was a little boy. It was obviously more impactful on my family than it was on me. I asked him, I said, Serge, are there things that your family 
has tried hard to preserve over these years? And he says, absolutely. We talked about things like how important it is for his parents to still speak their language. How important it is to keep certain customs. How important it is to keep certain traditions. How important it is that their children not just get absorbed or lost in the surrounding culture that they're now living. When you live as an exile. So in the Old Testament, we have stories of exile. So when you think about the word that is actually used in Greek here, diaspora, it is a reference to the Jewish people who were forced out of Israel to live among the Gentile populations of the world. And so when Jews were forced out, their greatest concerns were that we preserve language, that we preserve customs that we preserve, tradition that we preserve, our religion. And one of their greatest concerns was that our children will not just get absorbed in the culture. Now, Simon Peter writes mostly Gentiles who don't really understand exile. But he uses lots of Old Testament language. And the reason that he does is because he wants them to see that you are truly through Jesus Christ, part of Abraham's family, who was in exile, left his country, wandering, looking, searching for his future home. And you, like him, are wandering. Even though you haven't left your home, you're in this world, but you're really not of this world. And he uses the word metaphorically. And you too are looking for your true home in heaven. So now I just think we ought to talk for a minute, okay? You and I, live here in Oklahoma City, in the United States of America. If somebody says, where's your home? You might say, oh, I live over here just a few miles away. But as followers of Jesus Christ, we would also be willing to admit that sometimes this world seems like a very strange place to us. We would say there are times when I don't know if I really fit here. I feel a little bit displaced. The values that I have are not like the values of this world that I live in. The the beliefs that I have are not the beliefs of this world that I live in. I sometimes stand out. I'm sometimes different. I, I feel like a lot of my life I live counterculturally. <laughs> I, I tend to go against the flow. And so, as we see this exile language used metaphorically in the New Testament, it applies to Christians of all ages. Shouldn't we be different? Should we always fit in? Should we not? Stand out? Should people not look at us and realize we're not like everybody else? Growing up in a church in a small Kentucky town, there was a song that we would sing once in a while, and the language went something like this This world is not my home, I'm just passing through. Here's what I'm trying to say. And here's what's important to say, that knowing who you are is of utmost importance. And that because when you're in exile, it's easy to forget who we are. Here's always the temptation to be absorbed by the culture. And to adopt the values and the beliefs of the culture in which you're living. To begin to only speak their language. And to begin only to value what they value. And and Paul is, I'm sorry, Peter is trying to say to these 
people in Asia Minor, do you understand that even though this is where you were born maybe and where you were raised, this is not your home. You have a dual citizenship. While you're citizens here, you are citizens of the kingdom of God. And you will never, ever, ever fully blend in. And you shouldn't. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about being people who, you know, are such to the degree of that we're social misfits who nobody could ever relate to or understand or ever want to know. That's not where I'm trying to go. But it's that in seasons like we're in right now, where our nation is at such unrest and so much is being said and emotions are so raw, we are the people who are quick to listen, slow to speak. Our words are very calculated and slow to become angry. And it should be that the world is saying, we should pay more attention to the church right now because they're not talking out of emotion. It should be that the rest of the world is saying, we should lean in and hear what the church is saying because before they spoke, they listened really well. It, it should be that the world is saying, we should be listening to the church right now because their words are very calculated. We should be listening to the world. The world should be saying, we should be listening to the church right now because, because they're not quick to become angry and emotional. We, we're always going to be a little different. We're, we're kind of strangers to this land. We're citizens of another kingdom, and our values are different. All right, so it's of most importance. It's essential that you know who you are. And, and the reason is, is because when you live as we live, metaphorically as exiles, in a land where we always don't fit, we could forget our identity and we could, we could begin to blend in with the culture around us way too much. So let me, let me talk to you about what we must do. And this is where Simon Peter takes us today. I, I, I want to... I want to talk to you about someone else. I talked to you about Serge a minute ago. I want to talk to you about somebody else for a minute. And, and there, um, you might guess before I get to the end who I'm talking about, but uh, this is a person uh, that I would say, and, and, and everybody listening to me knows, knows this person, okay? Uh, it's a person that I would say is truly among God's elect. There's no doubt that God has expressed their grace, His grace to them. Um, I, I don't have any problem saying this individual has been, has been chosen by God, okay? You're, you're, you're searching right now. You're, you're trying to get with me, aren't you? You're wondering who I'm going to say. I'm, you, you know them, I promise you. Not only have they been chosen by God, I mean to the point that God has put his finger toward them and said, it, it's you. I'm I'm choosing you. And, and they've also been sanctified. I think once you hear who, uh, you'll agree. Not only just set apart in the sense for God's service, but this ongoing work of God making them like Christ. This, we talk about sanctification as being set apart. This person has been born again. This person has this living faith and this living hope. Do you know who it is yet? It's you. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about you. I mean, to be God's elect means that you've received God's grace. To be chosen means that God one day looked at you and said, I want a relationship with you. I'm choosing you. I'm coming after you. I'm moving all the way to where you are. I'm going to come to you. I'm going to tell you that I want a relationship with you. I want to know you. I want to love you. I want to live in a relationship with you. Sanctified you by His Spirit. Called you out of a life of sin. Moved you into a life of growing to become more like Christ. I'm talking about you. And, and this whole 
reason for choosing and sanctifying you is for a purpose that you would live your life in obedience to Jesus. I'm just using the language out of the scripture here. And that you would be sprinkled by the blood of Jesus, that you would be made pure. You've been born again, this new birth, this new life. You now have this new status before God, filled with hope. You're an heir. I I remember one time somebody said to me, something about their finances and I knew this guy fairly well this is years ago and yeah it's tough financially it's not going to matter though when my parents die we're going to be set anyway because they're loaded now that's hope isn't it (laughs) Paul says you have this hope you have this inheritance that's kept in heaven for you and he goes on to talk about how you live this life that is filled with joy you greatly enjoy even in your suffering even in the midst of covid crisis even in the midst of those people he's writing to suffering because of their faith and you live in this relationship with Jesus though you haven't seen him you believe in him though you don't see him now you love him this is who you are and so all i'm saying is you just got to remind yourself of your identity now, why, why is all of that so important that you today remember, I am, look at me, I'm among God's elect, you know? <laughs> I am God's chosen man. I have been sanctified by the Holy Spirit of God. He has a purpose for my life. I have this new life that God has given me. I have hope and joy and faith. I have an inheritance waiting for me one day. I mean, why is it important? Because because there's an enemy who lies all the time. I remembered as I was moving toward this sermon, remembering about a story that I'd read a, a few years ago in a book called Rescue, compiled by the Brooklyn Tabernacle, the church there that Jim Simbola pastors in Brooklyn, New York. And it's story after story of lives who have just been transformed. I opened the page and there was a picture of the story this was about. His name is Lawrence. He stands six feet, five inches tall, African-American gentleman. He said, when I was born, nobody really wanted me. By the time that my mother gave birth to me in New York City, my father was long gone. I never saw him. I don't know who he is. I just know that I reminded my mother of him and she hated me for it. My mother took me when I was two months old to a place called Antigua in the West Indies and left me with my grandmother. It didn't bother me that my, my mother was older than everybody else's mother. I didn't even know it as a little boy. I just knew that she loved me when nobody else did. And those first seven years of my life were good, but my grandmother became ill. I can't take care of a little boy. Immediately, I was sent to New York to live with my mom. She did not want me. She would say to me, you're no good, you're no count, (laughs) you'll never amount to anything, you're just like your dad. He was no good, he was no account, he would never amount to anything either and you're just like him. And so he said the abuse started immediately. First it was belts and shoes, and then her favorite thing to discipline me with became an electrical extension cord. My, 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 my extended family in New York saw it. I remember one day specifically when I was six or seven years old, my aunt said to me, you got to stop, you're going to kill him. My mother's response was, it doesn't matter. He's only taken up place on the earth anyway. He'll never be anything. He's just like his sorry father. And so he said, when I was 13, we moved. I'm sorry, that happened when he was older than six or seven. But when I was 13, 
we moved to Miami. Life was better in Miami because in Miami, coaches liked me. I was, I was getting tall, and they all wanted me to play their sports. And so basketball was what I was best at, even though I played many sports. And I loved it in Miami. And I was getting too big for my mother to abuse any longer. And my life was getting better. I was MVP my senior year. I was All-American. I had scholarships offered to me from many colleges. My mother didn't care about that. My coach decided which college I would attend for me. And I went to a college in Atlanta on a full ride, and I played, and my first year was great, and my second year was great, and then I had a leg injury, and it took me out of basketball for good. I was done. So without a scholarship, I couldn't stay in school. I had to drop out. I called my mother, and she said, you're not coming here. Don't think about it. Not room for you here. So I went back to New York City. There was some extended family. I slept on couches. I worked. I saved money had an uncle who gave me a little money, and I was able to fulfill a dream to go to flight school in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I found a roommate. I got a job washing dishes at a Denny's. It wasn't long before the job at Denny's ran out. The roommate said, you can't stay here if you can't pay rent. I was sleeping anywhere that I could, homeless, always outdoors. I didn't know anybody. I couldn't get a job. I looked awful. He said, the thing about being homeless is that you can never get clean. You never have enough to eat. You're alone except for flies all day long and mosquitoes all night long. I was walking through two apartments one day and I saw a mattress sticking out of a dumpster that somebody had thrown away. I pulled it out of the dumpster and I laid it on the ground and that became my home. That's where I slept for months. I sold blood, $7 a pop, two to three times a week. I'd buy bread, something to eat with the money from the plasma. I tried and tried to get a job, but when people saw me, I knew that I had no hope of getting a job. And finally, I saved enough money to buy some pills and just decided that my mom was right. How could I get to this place? How could I get so low? And the only conclusion that I had was my mom was right all along. I was worthless, I was no good, I was no account, my life would never mean anything. All I'm doing is taking up space on the planet. And I decided I'm gonna go to sleep on this mattress and I'm never gonna wake up again. And it's all going to be over. He said, laying there on that mattress with that bottle of pills, it was not uncommon to hear somebody's radio or television blaring because a window was open and I heard the voice of a preacher on a television. And he yelled out, God loves you. Jesus gave his life for you. And I began to wonder if it was true. And he went on talking about how much God loved me and how much Jesus cared for me. I began to believe it. Call out to Jesus right now, he said. Ask him into your heart. And I began to do it. I said, I don't even know what it means, Jesus, but I'm asking you into my heart. And he said, something happened to me. It's like what Peter talks about happened to these Gentile believers in Asia Minor. New birth, living hope. He said, I look back on it and I think, how could a person who was in my position in that moment have been so joyful? But I was. I was overwhelmed with joy. And I'll make the rest of the story quick, but he gets up and he goes to that Denny's and he says, to a guy that he used to work with, is there any food being thrown away today? I've got to eat. And he says, hey, he's looking for a dishwasher. And he said, I'm going to apply. And he said, you you can't apply looking like that. He's not going to give you a job. And he had mercy on me and he let me go to his little apartment and get cleaned up and go apply for the job. I got the job part-time washing dishes. I got another job part-time at a hotel across the street. I got back into flight school 
I finished my degree. I eventually moved back to New York City one night at Madison Square Garden. I went with a friend to hear a choir sing, the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. And they told story after story that was my story. I met a woman in the church. We're married. We have a little girl. You know what he came to learn? His mother was wrong. You see, the enemy lies about your identity. And I think it's good today to come to church and be reminded that you are among God's elect. Straighten your back and raise your chin. You have been chosen by God. He picked you out of the crowd. You have been sanctified by His Spirit. You have been set apart because God has a purpose for your life. You've been given this new birth into this living hope. You're filled with joy and hope. And you live in relationship with Jesus Christ himself. Think about it. This is who you are. Let's stand. And let's celebrate the goodness of Jesus in our identity with him. Christ and you are chosen by him. So go out and live a life worthy of that love. You are dismissed. God bless you.